It is early in the little town. The sun is starting to show itself. He is in a gully by the river. Trees hang low, trying to hide him. He was careful. He made sure no one saw him. Fog rolls over the banks as if poured from a cup. From the cup of judgment, he thinks. A stone turns under his foot. One last look around. There is no one. He is ready. He kneels down with the pan and fills it with a little dirt and sets to washing it in the water. He swirls it and pours a little out. Come on, be there. Swirls it and pours a little out. His eyebrows raise with excitement. He is gleaming, a twinkling, as if a, a splinter of the sun found its way into his pan. He's had the fever for so long. I knew it, I knew it. He reached for it, careful, he says aloud, like a madman, and takes the nugget. Between thumb and forefinger, it ain't no bigger than a sesame seed. After 25 years of struggle and every single penny to his name, it ain't no bigger than a sesame seed. It doesn't matter. It's here. I knew it was here. Something moved behind him. He froze. Now a click. Metal on metal. He put the nugget in his mouth as judgment spoke. Turn around so I can see your face. And he did so. The barrel was so close it almost hit him in the nose. Find anything, Jack? He couldn't speak. Recognition held his mouth shut. He couldn't believe it. His first thought was for his wife. His second thought, I'm pissing on myself. There was a third thought, or maybe a prayer. He swallowed the nugget, and just like that, it happened. He heard it first. It wasn't a loud bang, more like a pop. Then he felt it. The world turned sideways. His face slammed against the shallow water, and he couldn't move. Water was in his nose, in his ears, and in his mouth, half in and half out. He opened an eye. It was hard, but he did it, and he saw the fella. It looked like he was walking on the wall. Then he realized, I'm laying down, and everything faded to black. May 1st, 2035. They are all dead, as extinct as the winter snow in New Orleans. Yet the gold cord that binds his mind to their hearts is not macerated, soft, or tender. Rather, it is swollen, and rigor mortis has set in. The small Cessna banked right as its pilot spoke loudly to be heard in the passenger's headset. She'll be coming up here real soon. Be on the lookout for a tall concrete structure with trees coming out of its roof. Supposedly it's by a lake. There's likely a lot of graffiti on it, so just look for the lake. It'll help us get our bearings on the location of the rest of the town. A never-ending expanse of forest and trees was before them. Giant green firs appeared black against the gray overcast sky. Fog was settling on the hills. The hum of the engine with the whistling of air streaming around the fuselage produced a symphonic drone, dissonant notes, a haunting soundtrack of anticipation and impending doom. Still, they flew through the cloud cover. When we see it, can we fly lower to get a better look? That was Mike, a 33-year-old New Orleans-based journalist who, for the last 10 years, has been obsessed with a piece of real estate located in the Oregon Cascade foothills. 
about 13 miles north of old Highway 26. It all depends, the pilot said. He was a tall, pudgy man, almost too big for such a small plane. He wore cowboy boots, jeans, and a brown leather jacket lined with red flannel. His hair was long, shaggy, and wild. His beard was so large, it made his head look too big for his frame. The headset he wore seemed to disappear in tendrils of hair so thick the microphone jutting out appeared to be some kind of alien appendage. What does it depend on? Mike asked. There's been rumors of squatters shooting at planes. I'm not going to spend the night out here. Mike thought about how the large man said she'll be coming up. To him, it was a she or a her. He whispered her name, Verona. He was excited to see her. It took five years to save up the money for this trip, and almost as long to plan every detail. The list looked like this. Leave New Orleans, arrive in Portland, rent a Land Rover, buy gear, charter the plane, fly over and get tons of video. Note, verify MHSA, multi-leveled heat spectrum analyzer. That last item, the note, that was most important. MHSA stands for Multi-Leveled Heat Spectrum Analyzer. An MHSA stores multi-layers of thermal signatures inside of digital video. In reviewing the footage, the technician can dial through the thermal spectrum and see the thermal image video in real time without the images of spectrum not selected. If filming a person, when ground level is selected, the processor generates a video of the heat from the ground without the signature of the person. It's how he'll see through the tree cover. Are we getting the footage? If we fly over it, we're getting it. And then some. You'll be able to analyze the data being recorded along with the video, like you wanted. They flew on in silence, but not for long. The lonely bush pilot couldn't help himself. So what you out here looking for anyway? Mike wanted to tell, but knew what it could mean for him. He always wanted to tell, but never did. Mike wore his ability to keep a secret like a badge of honor. He avoided everyone, girlfriends, guy friends, church, you name it. If it involved seeing and talking to other people, he avoided it. Something his dad had said growing up, be the first and only and you'll be rich. The old man had said this about business and being an entrepreneur. But when Mike first caught the fever, he realized those words must be at the core of everything he did, even know. I had relatives that lived out there. I'm doing a story on one of them, Mike said. Oh, yeah? The pilot sounded excited. I had a few relatives way down the line that had lived there. What's the name? Maybe we're related somehow. Mike stared out the window at the trees rushing under him. He could see an outline of his reflection in the grass. He whispered under his breath, I doubt it. Mike thought for a second that he might be giving too much information if he gave the name, but then realized it was a perfect cover story. Blanchard! Jack Blanchard! The pilot, the Jack Blanchard, pronouncing the with a long E for emphasis. Yeah, Mike looked away as he said it. The burly bush pilot took the hint and waited to speak again. Jack Blanchard was the grandfather Mike never knew. He was murdered in January of 2013. Mike was 13 years old. Jack's story has become Mike's. It's why he's here. Learning the story of Jack's death is how Mike caught the fever. In 1996, 
Jack left the small New Orleans suburb and moved he and his wife, Rita, to a small northwestern town with the strangest of names. Vernonia. The place was rightly nicknamed Vernowhere by those who loathed the quaint and quiet. And all who knew Jack in the Pelican State, for the life of them, could not fathom the reason for such a move. When arriving in the little town, one would have thought he had always lived there. He knew landmarks, special locations, rivers, soil, and on and on. And now, some twenty-four years after his death, Mike believes, with good reason, Jack had the same affliction, the fever. When Jack was killed, his son Terry was made the sole executor of his estate. All of Jack's belongings were packed up and mailed in New Orleans. In 2023, at age 30, Mike, the son of Terry Blanchard, was rummaging through his grandfather's belongings and he found a journal. The title on the first page was Forest Gold. The cover of the journal was blank. There were folded papers between pages. Binding was coming apart in a corner. After several days of reading, he found an entry in the journal that changed everything for Mike. July 1st, 1996. I have found that one of the hardest things to do in this life is to keep secrets. I have also found the remedy for this. Keep to yourself. In 1848, someone whispered the word gold in the child's ear. They couldn't keep it in. They thought to themselves, it's just a child, what's it going to hurt? After gold came the words, American River. Then the most damning of all, the words that guaranteed the message's delivery, don't tell anyone. A bullhorn in a busy square, or a Sunday sermon, might as well have just printed it on the first page of the San Francisco newspapers. And that's exactly what happened two months later. But unlike what you'd think, no one believed the story as it was printed, or rather hidden, in tabloid fashion among stories of bearded ladies, Hollywood gossip, and pie-baking contests. Then there was that old fool, Sam. He'd found a bit of dust, put it in a little glass jar, and ran through the streets yelling, Gold! 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 Everyone who's anyone and anyone who wasn't, along with their kids, dogs, cats, and cattle, set out for the West, breathing Indians, hunger, the heat, and the cold, all because of the kinship felt between one fool and another and their recollection of tabloid gossip read six months earlier. It was an epidemic, contagious as the worst. It was known as the fever, gold fever. As doth the moth succumb to light's fatal charm, the preacher said, all stoic and reverent like he was auditioning for a Shakespearean play. There is one place history is forgotten, though, Oregon. By the time those with the fever reached the coast of the Western world, the rains had washed away all notions of finding gold among our mountains and hills. There were those whose sights were set on men who recovered from the illness and moved on. To the north they went. The gold was in the trees. So to the men who made their fortunes quenching the thirsts of the weary travelers in the search of the elusive sun rock. Gold was money, paper or not. Sons and daughters were given to the wonder and the power of the axe. Days would be spent breaking the back. And for what? A few ounces, maybe. And that's on a good day. You ain't never gonna get rich, quick boy. Moving rocks, panning all day, all bent over. When they got home, they never straightened. In the Oregon foothills, however, it was a different story. In a few hours, two men could fell a tree to provide enough wood for a small house. They mastered the power of that axe. 
Fortunes were made, families were fed, kings were made, and legends are dead. Between these two pages of Jack's journal was an article cut from a magazine or newspaper. The date was 2010. The printing was amateur at best and looked handmade and typed from a typewriter. The title in the heading said it came from panning from the inside. Teenage homeschooler finds gold in a riverbed behind house. The boy lived in a small town off the Oregon coast in the foothills. He read the article. 16-year-old Shane Cantrell found 10 ounces of gold in a 12-month period in the creek bed behind his house. The Cantrells are entertaining sale of property and our mineral rights. Clipped to the article was a Google Earth Street View picture of a blue building. The camera was pointed at the building sign, Oregon Coast Range, P-U-D. Written by hand over the building was Highest Bidder. There was another Street View photo and map of the house in the article showing the address of the house, written by hand, again. It was 10 a.m., 6-14-2005. His grandfather was looking for gold in Vernonia. When Mike realized this, he was infected. He kept the journal hidden and studied it every day, trying to learn what his grandfather knew. Mike argued with himself for years. It was there. All he had to do was get it. Then he understood there were other forces at work here. Jack was murdered because of the gold. He opened the photograph of the highest bidder. He had remembered the man John Lee who died in an Oregon prison last year for Jack's murder. Compared with autopsy report and other facts, Mike was the only person who believed John Lee didn't shoot Jack. The trip had acquired another layer to it. It wasn't just about the gold. It was about his grandfather. At least that's how he convinced himself it wasn't only about the gold. But as the madman who argues with himself and wins, he caught the fever. Mike caught the fever. There's gold out there. Now, 10 years and $60,000 later, here he is. They flew lower looking for the lake. All manner of limb and ground cover came up to greet or punish them. It was as if all the trees were raising their hands in thanksgiving that the town of loggers was destroyed and now dead. The men of the axe had been vanquished. Or were they reaching for the small plain in anger, a gnashing of teeth, their solitude disturbed? Blackberry bushes rolled like waves on the ocean. He inhaled, held it, and breathed, causing the small cockpit window to fog. He wiped at the moisture with the sleeve of his jacket. Then, as if he saw for the first time the sea of trees... He thought, is this what God feels like? Mike flashed back to his childhood in Sunday school, and the Spirit of God hovered above the waters. When Mike was a child, he was, as the old ladies would say, a good little Christian boy. That is, until he got to college. Then, from that first morning to the last night, he couldn't be bothered with the ignorant beliefs of his mother and father. And now, as providence would have it, he has become obsessed with the man who raised his father, who shared his parents' belief. Back in the plane, Mike pulled out a pocket-sized notebook, his own journal, and began to write. Intent on capturing this moment and to make manifest the immaterial thoughts in his head, he imagined the trees dictating and he the scribe. They were there when Jack froze as his eyes met the gun in his killer's hand. 
The only living witnesses to a crime deemed solved, case closed, forgotten like this place. He could have written a book about all this, but he didn't. He wanted to write a book about this or that for 20 years, but never did. He was the kind of person that always talked about doing something, but never does because they get sidetracked and do something else. But when Mike got the fever, this he stayed true to, like all diseases, at least the ones that are fatal. They dictate your every move, every thought, like octopi. There is a tentacle in everything. Wait, Mike said. There it is, the lake, go lower. Whoa, easy there, killer. I always circle first. We have no idea who's squatting down there. Mike had not just traveled all this way to be turned back by whatever this guy was afraid of. He considered his options and came to the conclusion that as long as he was in this plane, he had none. Circle back around was uneventful, so they flew lower. The pilot was right. The canopy of trees prevented just about all identification. He would have to review the footage, because when he returns... It'll be on foot.